All right, guys. Welcome back. It is Saturday night, March 7th, 2020, just after 8 p.m. Eastern time. Got Gunner joining us right now for his weekly piece of the show. It is Fact or Fiction with Gunner. We've just completed four episodes with uh, going through Operation High Jump, and I think we're going to continue on with that a little bit tonight, but a little different twist. I'll uh, bring Gunner on. Gunner, are you with us there, sir? I'm here, Mac. How are you? Oh, doing good, man. Trying to stay a little warm. It's a little a little breezy out there tonight. It's kind of chilly for March. Well, it's, it's, it's great up here. <laughs> you know, the weather's starting to break and the snow's melting off. It's just beautiful. Oh, man, that's good <laughs> to hear. It, well, it, it's it's getting that way here, too, but it's certainly a tonight. It feels a little chilly for some reason, but not as chilly as it is in Antarctica for sure. So. <laughs> no, no. As we've covered, we've enjoyed uh, the details you've been giving us with Operation High Jump and going through that. But tonight we've got a little different twist on that. And I, I know that this 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 idea came to you just because of some of the other conversations that we had. So I'll throw it to you. And, and, and how did you come up with this particular angle? Well, uh, it's not because it's Women's Month. <laughs> I, I don't uh i'm just not that good Mac. i mean i don't care you know i'm just not that good very ironic um, it, well yes it is but uh you know like i could say I, I you know you never know where an investigation is, is going to take in and i guess you know sometimes chasing down leads and falling into rabbit holes is worth it and what this is how i found this story because when i was investigating high jump uh it was the claim that there was a British base on this peninsula, and so I investigated that. And you know, when when explorers re- refer to a base, it, it doesn't mean military base. You know, it, it's just uh, well, in this case, it was home to the British Antarctic Survey Station E, and also the Rani Antarctic Research uh, Expedition, and uh, it, it was the base for many of the historic uh, uh, surveying missions. Uh, beginning in, in the 40s, and uh, that particular station was occupied until, like, February 75, and uh, they had some main buildings that they cleaned up and repaired in 1992, and, and these, what they call these huts, are actually protected under the, the Antarctic Treaty that, that we discussed. So, huh. yeah, so I came across what is known as, as the, the Rani Expedition, and uh and this is the story of of that and of course uh we had uh we all remember listening to the clip of Admiral Byrd right <laughs> where he where he says that uh no woman had set foot in Antarctica before <laughs> and i said that he was wrong right you did yes and i'm going to prove that he was wrong <laughs> uh because there were women in An- Antarctica um, before before this, and the first was uh, a woman named Ingrid Christensen uh, with her friend uh, Matilda Wagner or Wegger, I should say, and uh, they were the first to circumnavigate uh, and view the continent from from her husband's Norwegian whaling ship. Wow! <laughs> and that was in 1931, <laughs> right? Wow. She must and, have been uh, one tough broad, man. I mean, as a whaling ship around Antarctica. Well, yeah. Well, these were the days, man. I'm going to get into that a little bit more. Okay. But, I mean, this is when men were men and women were women. You know, if you know what I mean. Yeah, right. And uh, the second was uh, a Carolyn Mickelson. And she was the first to actually step ashore on, on one of the islands out there called Tyne Island. And, uh, and that was also... a the, off the same whaling ship, but that was in 1935. And then, uh, Ingrid Christensen went back, uh, and she was the first to, the first woman to fly over Antarctica. And, uh, she dropped a Norwegian flag, uh, you know, just like Bird did with his flags. Well, she dropped the Norwegian flag, uh, over, over there in, uh, 1937. Wow. <laughs> and then 10 years later, a woman named uh, Edith Ronnie, and whose nickname was Jackie, um, became the first uh, American woman to step to uh, to to set foot on Antarctica, and she was also the first uh, to win her over. Um, you know, with with a uh, with a friend of hers, a, a Canadian, 
uh, named uh, Jenny Darlington, and this was in 1947. Wow. And it, this was right on the heels of the high jump operation. <laughs> huh. I mean, right on the heels of it. You know, it's, it's so it, it's very interesting. It, it's it's ultimately a better story. And and I'm just I'm just really happy that that I that I found it and I, and I present all of it to you. And uh, uh, her name was uh, Edith Anna Maslin, and she was born October 13th, uh, 1919, in Baltimore, Maryland. And she died June 14th, uh, 2009, in Bethesda, Maryland. And she was 89. Mm-hmm. And she's buried in Arlington National Cemetery with her husband. And just a couple rows from Admiral Byrd. And, uh, she was raised in a poor conservative family in Baltimore, but she was pretty smart and, uh, she even graduated high school at age 16. And, uh, she attended Worcester College in Ohio and, uh, George Washington University. Hmm. And she was a history major. She graduated in uh, 1939. And she worked for the National Geographic Society and eventually the U.S. Uh, State Department, uh, the Office of uh, Foreign Affairs. Huh. And that's where she met a man named Commander Finn Ron, Ronnie, I should say, in Washington, D.C. in 1942, and they were married in 1944. And uh, so... Jackie Ronnie, as they called her, her nickname, uh, Jackie, was was from college. And so she married into this family of Antarctic explorers uh, because her husband, uh, Finn Ronnie, uh, was born in 1899. He died in 1980 at age 80. Interestingly enough, he he died in a similar way that Bird did um, with a heart ailment and in his sleep. Um, and he had already been uh, on two uh, missions to Antarctica b- before he married Jackie, and he promised her he wouldn't go again, but he was really secretly planning another expedition someday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, can, uh, can you see the photographs that I have there? I do, yes, yeah. Uh, okay, just I'm just checking it, because, uh, because he was the son of uh, Martin Ronnie, who was a sailmaker and and, uh, and a tent maker? <clears throat> and this, he had this, served with this guy Martin Ronnie. Looks like uh, straight off the set of what? What's that Jeremiah movie? Johnson. Jeremiah Johnson. If you ever saw that movie, I tell you, well, I, I tell you what, man, <laughs> this guy was a sailmaker. You know, and and I'm a wooden ship modeler, so I so I have to study a lot of this stuff, right? Right. How the sails were made, what they looked like, why they were made, the way they were made, uh, why they were made that way. And uh, this guy had served with uh, the famous explorer uh, Ronald Amundsen in Antarctica. He served with him for 20 years on on his ship, uh, the schooner Fram, hmm. and, uh, and and he also took part in in, in the bird expedition to Antarctica in uh, 1928 to, to 1930. I mean, look at the hands on that guy, Mac. Yeah, he looks. I mean, they look almost. I mean, guy, they look like, look like a chimp. You know, they 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 look they look so big that they could just reach out and put the claw on. Well, it. you betcha. I mean, it, just the uh, hands made of steel. And I mean, being a sailor back then in the age of sail was no joke. I mean, you had to be tough. It, it was. It was. I mean, it was one of the toughest jobs on the face of the earth. And uh, and this guy had it. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, like, for, for all the people listening out there, his photograph almost looks like a caricature of of someone you could you could say it'd have been a sailor who's weathered. He has the weathered look, yeah. and his eyes just look yeah. tough, you know. <laughs> yeah, he just he just looks tough. And and if you look at the photograph I, I posted of of the schooner itself of of him and the famous explorer uh, Ronald Amundsen uh, aboard the aboard the Fram in 1910. Where you can see the sled dogs laying around, and he's working on his sewing machine there. Yeah, I mean that's just that's those, just classic. Those stuff dogs there. are gigantic. The one that's closest, his head is like. I mean, honestly, my <laughs> arms would reach around his shoulders, and I, it would be yeah. you know three feet in diameter. <laughs> he's massive. Yeah, there, there's about there's there's nine or ten uh, sled dogs there. Yeah, and uh, they and they're working. He's working on a, on a sail or something uh, on the sewing machine 
underneath a piece of canvas that, that he probably created. I mean, he made the sails for that ship. So, so you that, know? you know, that's a whole nother, and you know, as, as, adventurous as we have approached bird being you know going down there with all the military yeah. equipment stuff to sail in an area where you don't it's been basically unexplored at least you have no navigation you know markers or anything and you're going to sail where you know there's ice where you can't just turn on yeah. a penny or a diving on a wooden ship <laughs> yeah i mean with a wooden ship <laughs> that yeah. takes some big and of balls. course this if, if you know about the about the age of exploration uh and and sail about that time these guys were all competing. Amundsen and uh, Scott and uh, uh, there was one more guy who just, just slips my mind. I, I should be embarrassed that I, I don't. They they were all competing to get these places first, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, so I, it was it was a big deal. But you, I mean, it was just uh, it, it's just amazing to to study about and and see these old photographs uh, of, of things like that and, and what these guys were made of and what it took. You know, no kidding, man. I mean, just imagine the you know keeping the dogs on the ship. I mean, our dog drives us crazy the way he is. I can't imagine having a bunch of these dogs, you know, trying to maintain yeah. them. You know, and you know they're they're out of their mind, you know, crazy on this ship because they can't run around. And uh, just, I bet it's a, just, a, I bet it's a circus. <laughs> yeah, and and the guy and the guy that had just slipped my mind just now was uh, Ernst Shackleton. Uh, that remember I told you somebody gave me a book about that expedition and they asked me to build a model ship. Yeah, right. Yep. Um, right for for them and yeah, so that was all about that. But um, so this Martin Ronnie actually turned Bird down twice <laughs> for that expedition in 1928 and 30. But but I guess that uh, uh, Bird offered him so much money he came out of retirement at age 67. <laughs> now imagine at, this guy's already been at sea with Amundsen. And he's retired. He's he's 67 years old, and he volu- and, and he gets paid big money to go on this expedition with Bird in <laughs> 1928 and 30. I mean, that's that's one tough man. I yeah, guess, he, I guess. he definitely wasn't going to Boca Raton to retire at 67. <laughs> no, no, he he goes to the Antarctic. I mean, it's just incredible stuff. Yeah, man. it is. You know, so so Finn Ronnie his son was just fascinated with the exploration of course with his with his father and uh he became an athlete you know a, a skier uh he went to uh Horton Technical College and studied naval engineering so he had a degree in naval engineering and he immigrated to the United States in 1923 and became a citizen in uh 1929 and he worked for Bethlehem Steel and Westing Westinghouse and he also served as an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve in World War II. Wow. And uh, at the rank of commander, he later became captain. And, and for you uh, non-military folks out there, <laughs> the rank of captain is the same rank of, as a colonel in the Army. So oh, okay. That's, that's pretty good. It's right below general. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> he was up there. And uh, so he... He led this, uh, what was called the Ronnie Antarctic Research Expedition, um, and the acronym was RARE, R-A-R-E, <laughs> uh, from 1946 to 48. Actually, 1947-48 w- was the actual dates they were down there. And this was the last private expedition to Antarctica, and uh, they explored uh, the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula, um, the Palmer Peninsula, as it was known, and, and the Weddell Sea. I had mispronounced that before. I called it Weddell Sea, but I've been corrected. It should be Weddell Sea, <laughs> uh, the southern coast of that. And they did it both on the ground, and they had uh, three uh, ski-equipped aircraft that were loaned by the United States Army Air Force. Hmm. And uh, Finn uh, was, was a veteran of two prior Ar- Antarctic expeditions, including the second bird expedition and the U.S. Antarctic Service expedition. And he was chosen by Bird because Bird knew his father so well, you know, because his father had been on that expedition with Bird. Huh. And, uh, but I soon found that, uh, there were, there were problems with, with Bird. Because as soon as World War II ended, it was like, uh, Finn began planning another expedition 
And uh, Admiral Byrd just <laughs> happened to live a block away from him. Uh, and uh, they were friends at the time, and I guess he he wanted to urge Finn to join forces with him to, for Operation High Jump. But Finn didn't want to do that. He wanted to do his own thing, you know, and do this own private uh, operation. Right. And so, uh, you know, I mean, he was he was even second in command on the uh, 1939-41 uh, Antarctic Service Expedition. But remember I said that uh, in that expedition, that was when Byrd was recalled to active duty. So as second in command, uh, Finn Ronnie took over for him. You know, and so uh, I, I don't know if that was some animosity started there. But anyway, Bird did everything he could to, to just torpedo uh, any fin, any plans uh, Finn had for his own independent expedition, you know. <laughs> and and he even demanded that Finn give him all of his detailed plans. And, and Finn did it reluctantly. But then Bird presented them as his own plans for an expedition. Oh, wow. And he didn't even ch- he didn't even change the wording in the proposal, <laughs> you know. Just straight and up it, plagiarism. It was, well, that's right. And and he stabbed Finn in the back. He double crossed him. Wow. Oh. You know, and and hmm. uh, that was just you know, hmm. like I said, Bird was a was was a driven man, and I and I said it before. I said that he would that he would do bad things to to get where he wanted to be. Interesting. And this is the. And this is the example of it right here, mm. you know. But you know, despite Bird's opposition to him, um, he still got a lot of a lot of help from other people, um, including uh, General Curtis LeMay, and then lots of other other people. And uh, you know, it it but it did hurt his uh, his funding, you know. Um, and uh, I guess Finn began raising money as soon as the war was over. It was, it was just a struggle, and uh, and uh, Bird wasn't supporting him, and he, you know was probably against him in it. And so, but and to this day, according to uh, Judith Weinrub, a, a Washington Post staff writer, I guess who who interviewed uh, Jackie Ronnie, said to this day Jackie Ronnie holds Bird accountable for unexpected minefields her husband encountered. Establishing the expedition and for a short, short string budget, true string budget of fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> wow, <laughs> fifty thousand. Of course, Ronnie had, had hoped to raise one hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. And remember when I, yeah, remember when I estimated the cost of high jump? I heard it somewhere that that was three hundred fifty thousand. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so I mean, guy. it, it kind of makes sense that you know that bird, if he if he was if let's just let's assume that that's correct, three fifty, and there was somebody out there who was lowballing it at one fifty, maybe there was somebody you know, I mean, they, they were human beings, maybe there was some money being made somewhere along the way, you know, for these adventures. <laughs> well, I, I I think the bird tried to hijack Ronnie's Ronnie's plans. I, I think mm-hmm. when he found out that Ronnie wasn't didn't want to be a part of his expedition. That was government paid at three hundred and fifty, you know. And of course, he wanted he wanted to just take his plans and roll that into high jump. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, and, and somehow and and, and uh, but for some reason, you know, Ron, Ronnie didn't. I, I think I, I think uh, <laughs> I think he wanted to do it on his own for a good reason, and I think that pissed Bird off, and, and he just and so he just went against him. Uh, so you know, less than. Fifty thousand dollars was raised, you know, and and yeah. and a lot of the participants were unpaid volunteers. But but thanks to General Curtis LeMay, uh, they had several military personnel that were seconded to the expedition. I guess that means they were active duty, but they were put on furlough or something as volunteers, you know, uh, including the two principal pilots. And uh, of course, the Air Force donated three planes, equipment, spare parts, and clothing. And uh, Jackie's role in all this, of course, to, to just to help him, uh, was was to edit um, and type all the correspondence. You know, trying to get these proposals in in order. And uh, of course, um, at the same time he was doing this in '46, as he was presenting presenting his proposals. 
He, Finn also served on the task force that created the Tool Air Force Base in Greenland, and he assisted uh, Tor Heyerdahl in planning his 1947 trip across the Pacific on the balsa raft Contiki. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, he he helped him plan that uh, that expedition too. Wow, man, and, uh, this guy was all over the yeah. place. <laughs> yeah, and of course, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll mention that uh, Tool is uh, named for Ultima Tool, which is Latin for uh, the farthest. And it's a medieval medieval name for the land that's that's farthest to the north. And the name Tool comes from uh, the Greek. Uh, it's sort of a place uh, a place name that was dated in the 3rd century B.C. Uh, for a land that uh, the Greeks believed to lie to the north of Britain. Huh. And... Uh, the, the Greek pronunciation is, is different. It's sort of a soft th, like tool, um, but they use the Latin hard t tool um, in the name of the air base and, and all that. And of course, um, the Nazi Tool Society identified with the same thing with the Greeks as this lost ancient landmass in the extreme north near Greenland or Ice, Iceland, and you know these these. Nazi mystics uh, to be some kind of ancient capital, some fictional thing or whatever. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, but 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 that's it, it, it. There's no connection with the Tool Air Force Base in Greenland to the Nazis, is is what I'm trying yeah. to say. It's the name was derived from, from from the same thing, but it's something totally different. And uh, so the the, the expedition uh, departed from uh, Beaumont, Texas on January 27, 1947, and they had three planes. They had a, they had a, a twin-engine uh, C-45 Beechcraft, uh, Nordwin C-64 Northman, and a Stinson L-5. That was the smallest one. And one of the planes, uh, the C-45 Beechcraft, uh, and the most important, was damaged uh, uh, when a crane cable broke while it was loading it on the ship. Mm. And uh, Ronnie had to go to Washington, D.C. He had to go back there to get congressional approval uh, to get another plane. <laughs> and uh, General Curtis LeMay replaced it with an exact match. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> which is cool. And uh, all the, all the uh, participants in the expedition were volunteers, uh, including uh, uh, an Eagle Scout from Beaumont, Texas, named uh, Arthur Owen. And uh, he was selected... Uh, as a second East Eagle Scout to go to the South Pole. And the first one was Paul Seipel. <laughs> Remember Paul Seipel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who, 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 who had gone with Commander Byrd in, in yeah. uh, 1928. Uh, yes. Yeah. And so Finn uh, w- was also part of that expedition in 28. And uh, his experience with uh, Paul Seipel uh, made him decide to, to include a Boy Scout uh, on this expedition as well. And so they had a, like a contest or something, and uh, there were there were two cho- uh, you know two one was a runner up, and and the one that was chosen was uh, Arthur Owen, and uh, the ship they had was a, a 183 foot, 1200 ton wooden hold ship um, called <laughs> the uh, the Port of Beaumont, <laughs> just because that's where it was from, <laughs> and uh, so they had. Uh, 21 explorers. They had Eagle Scout Charlie Landry. He was the runner-up, and uh, he traveled with them uh, as far as Panama. And then the, from these donations, uh, they, they flew him back to Texas. So he didn't go all the way, but you mm. know, he, at least he got something out of it. Yeah. And then they had, uh, along with the airplanes, uh, 21 crew crew members. They had 30 tons of coal, 100 ton. 155 gallon drums of gasoline, all the dogs, uh, food for two years, and the rest of the supplies. And so you, the the total mileage of the voyage was like 16,000 miles. And uh, and so and so they headed down there. <laughs> two years of food. They had, they planned on uh, they planned on meeting some hardships along the way. They weren't going to starve. <laughs> well, they 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 were going to overwinter, so they were oh, they okay. were going to. They were, they were ready for anything, you know. They, yeah. they were ready for the worst. I mean, he, obviously, his his logistics were 
just as good as birds, maybe, maybe if not better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, and when, uh, he approached Jackie about going and, uh, and she said, no way, you know, there's no <laughs> way she was going to do it. And of course she got a lot of pressure from her family that was just horrified. You know, <laughs> she was going to go on, she might go on this expedition. Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. at one point, uh, one of her aunts wrote, wrote her and said, and don't forget, you'll ruin your complexion. <laughs> Frostbite. And, uh, you might lose your nose. Yeah, whatever, right? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, she eventually agreed to go uh, because what they had to do is they, they had to go down to South America and they had to wait for uh, that plane that Curtis, Curtis LeMay authorized to get flown down there. So they, so they had some time to wait, uh, down in Chile, I think it was. And, and while they were there, he, she convinced her friend, Jenny Darlington, to go with him. <laughs> and so, uh, because Jackie wanted to avoid being the first and only lady down there, you know, to, to set foot in Antarctica. And, and, uh, but Jenny Darlington didn't have any official, uh, role in the expedition. Um, but, you know, so, while they while they were down there, the girls uh, gathered all these last minute supplies, you know, parkas and all this stuff like that, and boots, and uh, and uh, Jackie resigned from her State Department job, and uh, Darlington and her husband, well, her husband was one, uh, the chief pilot. Her name his name was Harry Darlington, and of course they joined the expedition on the spur of the moment while they were in Chile. And, and Darlington was also the first woman to become pregnant in Antarctica. And, uh, that's got that's got to be a scary that's got to be a scary thing. Yeah, <laughs> but, right. uh, that's that's really interesting. That may be the most interesting thing about the story so far because I mean yeah, that, right. that that would be I mean I could see it happening. Don't get me wrong, but you know that that would could be oh, a yeah. very risky situation. You know, I mean, what if you get stuck or you know, winter? You know, mentioned winter, over winter in the down there and. You get snowed in, you know, a few months here or there, and not making it back. You're either having a kid on a ship in the middle of the of the of the sea, or you're having it yeah. on the, you know, in the middle of the bottom of the earth. I know, I, I, and you're newlywed, and and you're in in the most and hit one of the most in, inhospitable places on earth, and uh, and you're pregnant. I mean, oh my God, <laughs> what are we going to do, right? <laughs> so, um, unfortunately. Uh, though she went, you know, she agreed to go, but um, things happened, and she and uh, Jackie didn't get didn't uh, get along. I should say that they didn't speak um, the, for most of the expedition. But th- this might have been uh, due to issues between the spouses, uh-huh. I think. And um, you know, um, and she later wrote a book uh, that, that was titled uh, "My Antarctic Honeymoon." <laughs> <laughs> in which she concluded that women do not belong in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so the ship got down there and was purposely frozen into what was called the Marguerite Bay. And I think it might have been one of the first times, uh, according to this, they said it was the first time that a ship was uh uh, frozen into the ice intentionally, um, but it must have been. Finn must have thought it, it would it would be okay. And I mean, obviously, Shackleton had a ship uh, um, frozen into the ice, and I'm sure Amundsen uh, might have had as well. So I, I guess there's something about uh, a ship being frozen into the ice isn't as dangerous as, as a ship uh, trying to plow through it. You know what I mean? I, I, just, I don't know. No, I'm not sure, Gunner. It just sounds to me like a, <laughs> a wooden ship intentionally getting frozen just doesn't sound like a good outcome. I, get to, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. No, if, it doesn't. I, it just sounds scary to me because, I mean, that's a lot of pressure. I mean, you know, the ice and, and things like that are, are very powerful uh, forces, you know, and, and as they start to compound onto the sides of the ship, I mean, I guess steel is just as vulnerable, but wood just does not seem like I, the thing I want between me and the freezing arctic ocean or antarctic ocean <laughs> yeah me, me either and, and i found it really surprising that, that 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 decision was made but it was made and and uh and obviously it worked or you know i mean this, it obviously didn't was there was no uh, real danger 
or uh, jeop- uh, it didn't jeopardize the mission at all. So I don't know. I could look into it more <laughs> and, and figure out how, but uh, that's just amazing too, you know? It is. Certainly it is. <laughs> and, uh, and this, um, the place was called Stonington Island, and at that time it was connected to the Palmer Peninsula. And uh, they were using the same base that was used uh, during the 1938-41 expedition uh, that Finn Ronnie had been on. And uh, the ship anchored alongside the, the Palmer Peninsula, right in front of the British base um, that was built there during the war. And, uh, of course, the Stone, Stonington Island uh, Marguerite Bay base, um, the buildings... Um, were, were called East Base uh, during Byrd's third expedition, and it was also home to the Falkland Islands uh, Dependencies Base E campsite under the command of Major K.F. Pierce Butler, and uh, they developed a very good relationship, and, uh, and and they even shared some scientific work uh, between the two groups, and um, um, they arrived, as far as I could tell, Marguerite Bay, on March 12, 1947. And remember me saying that there were only three high jump ships in the Antarctic on February 26, 1947? Yep. Yep. And that, and then that two of them were, were in the Waddell Sea and, and heading for the South Atlantic, right? So they wouldn't have had any contact with the high jump mm. vessels at all, probably not. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so they landed, and uh, Edith Jackie Ronnie became the first American woman to set foot in Ant- set foot in Antarctica. You know, and of course, uh, <laughs> late and the first to to work on an expedition. Um, and of course, in, on the East Base there, they they had their own uh, place that they called the Ronnie Hut, <laughs> and and the Ronnie Hut was a uh, like a twelve by twelve uh, building. And I don't know about you guys, but my bedroom is twelve by twelve. <laughs> so, know, what, do you, what, what do you anticipate? This what are what is the sides of these things made out of, Gunner? Do you have any idea? I mean, it looks like a fabric, but I can't tell. Some of them maybe look a little more solid. Well, they're, no, they're they're more solid than that. Oh, I mean, okay. Finn Ronnie, Finn, Finn Ronnie. If you if you click on the photograph, it'll expand for you. Okay. So on the. the so the photographs that I've included of East Base there, yeah, you can click on it and it might bring it up a little closer for you. But they are wooden buildings, huh. and they've they've got chim they've got uh, you know uh, galvanized steel uh, chimneys for their for their uh, their stoves and you know I mean uh, so they hauled all that wood down there. I mean that that was a considerable amount of, of it, material. It was already there. <laughs> oh, okay. It was already gotcha. there, okay. Matt. Yeah. Okay. They gotcha. just they just they just occupied it. You know, yeah, th- this was built back back in you know like late thirty eight gotcha, or okay. early forties, so they would ju- they just took it over. Um, but but somewhere among that that stuff there uh, was the place they called the Ronnie Hut, and this was their living space was twelve by twelve foot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and like I said, I don't know, my bedroom is twelve by twelve foot, and I can't imagine living in there for a whole year. I mean, it, you think I'm nuts now? I I would be nuts after that. I don't know. As cold yeah. as it is down there, you might want as small of square footage as you could get to stay warm. Because that stove she's got well, doesn't look very big. Well, you got you got a point there too. Yeah, you got that right. <clears throat> yeah. So I mean, they 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 would have had uh, at least three and a half months of like total darkness, you know, and where they couldn't almost go outside at all, you know, and the weather was so bad. And so she, uh, but she wrote articles for the North American Newspaper Alliance, and she would send reports out several times a week uh, using teletype. And of course, a lot of time spent in knitting and and cooking. And I guess they put her knitting on display at the U.S. Naval Museum. <laughs> yeah, I noticed on one of these uh, pictures that you have included in your work here, Gunner, that I guess the women weren't the only ones getting pregnant with the puppy with she's holding. <laughs> Picture that was yeah, on. that's right. Yeah, they, uh, they had all all the all the husky dog teams that, that that she was taking care of and taking care of them and the puppies too. Yeah, so that was that was the job, and of course they had they had this outhouse down there. Now this this is I don't know, 
they had this outhouse down there. They called it the necessary room. <laughs> and, uh, this thing w- was, was built on sort of an ice cliff. <laughs> and, uh, they must have drilled, uh, drilled like one or two holes and then, and then put this outhouse above that. And, and this was this, uh, ice cliff that w- was situated over the bay, right? <laughs> yeah. So you had one or two holes in the outhouse and whatever was, come from the outhouse just dropped into the <laughs> dropped down to the frozen bay right you lost you, you, of, you really lost me at the outhouse over the ice cliff that just everything about that just sounds wrong <laughs> <laughs> well yeah it does it it, it, it is wrong <laughs> you know that and, just and they even had a ro- <laughs> they had, they had a rope attached to this thing so they wouldn't <laughs> get lost on the way to the outhouse right and uh and this is just i mean it, they said that uh it was a two-hole outhouse, and it was precariously stationed uh, on a on a cliff over the bay. And during blizzards, there there was a rope uh, strung from it to the buildings so that they could find a way to the outhouse by holding on to the rope. But these strong winds would come up from below the cliff and shoot up into the outhouse. <laughs> and, and if you were in there, I mean, it would just blow everything around. I mean, so you got See, toilet yeah. paper and whatnot and just flying all over the place. That's, that's, that's what so, they probably refer to as the Antarctic bidet. <laughs> well, I, I guess. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty bad. I mean, yeah. she said it was a miserable experience, and you really had to think twice before you decided you had to face it, you know. <laughs> you really had to go. <laughs> well, I, I guess, you know, it, it, it must have been must have been bad. I mean, Ooh. you know, and... and in the dead of an Antarctic winter, you know, there's there's no light for three and a half months. I mean, and you got to plan out when you want to take your own expedition to the outhouse. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, so, know? you know, sometimes these stories that you've been telling us, I, I get the little uh, hairs on the back of my head. I'm like, hey, you know, it'd be great to go have an adventure like that until we start talking about things like this. This, I don't want any part That's of this right. the outhouse <laughs> situation. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so you know, so they spent a lot of time in there. She she did her uh, writing for the newspaper alliance thing, and uh, Finn was plotting his his uh, his mapping flights uh, for the spring, and um, he would have her review the charts and everything with him, uh, just in case something something happened um, to him, you know, because he wanted her to lead the expedition. Now they knew that. A lot of people wouldn't be happy with that, but in the event that in the event that something happened, you know, Jackie knew what was going on, and, and she, so she was prepared to lead the expedition. And I, you know, there's there's no doubt about it. This was this was dangerous. You know, there's no doubt about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. <laughs> dangerous going to the outhouse. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You know, oh my God. You know, like so uh, they began their mapping. Uh, in the Antarctic in the spring of uh, 1948. Now, the spring down there is like November to February or something like that, you know. Mm, yep. And uh, and uh, her daughter, uh, Karen Ronnie Tupac, uh, made a presentation about her mother uh, for Ohio State University uh, to the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center in Columbus, Ohio in, in 2019. And she narrates about the photo mapping uh, and the aircraft they use in this clip I gave you. Here we go. And she loved those too. I have to go fast. But she also worked with scientists and she made field and flight trips into the unknown uh, for for mapping. And my fa- even though there was another woman along, my, you could be sure my father made sure my mother did everything first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and as I said, the primary goal was to map the unknown um, areas of the peninsula that were not known. And um, anyway, here's some, um, I have to go through this quick. Uh, there's my father getting into the main uh, plane that was going to take the photographs. And they had three planes, the Norsemen, Stinson, for people into planes. Um, Norsemen, Stinson L5, this is a port plane bringing the fuel, at, to along with the, the beach craft, which was the main um main film for the filming and what they did was they had um a camera on the left horizon a camera on the right horizon and these are the cameras they were big um and one facing straight down and they would fly along mountains and valleys and whatnot and take overlapping pictures and um 
Then they also had to make stops in the field in order to do sightings of the mountaintops so they could coordinate the site sightings in the field with the mountaintops, and that's how they mapped it. And uh, here again is the pit planes landed in the field and a couple shots of the scenery. And they, just, and they ended up discovering the last unknown coastline on the globe. And that area behind it, uh, my father named after my mother, Edith Ronnie Land, but it was discovered it was a much larger ice shelf than they realized. And in later years, it was named Edith Ronnie Ice Shelf and then Ronnie Ice Shelf. <laughs> Very, it's very interesting, and and one of the things that I thought was the most interesting part of that, Gunner, was that they actually had looked like they had taken the dogs on the planes uh, because they were camped out there in tents, and the planes were sitting there. I'd imagine that the dogs had been fly, flown out there to get to that point. Would that be accurate? Um, they they normally didn't fly with the dogs unless unless the dogs were sick or or injured or something like that. So those dogs had 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 come by sled. They got okay. there on their own. <laughs> oh wow, interesting. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh. And, uh go ahead. I I said that you know the the to, to think about all the uh, organization of what all these moving pieces are. You know, was there only one ship in this particular one, or was there multiple ships? Because I mean, I'm trying well, to understand the planes, how they got there as well. Well, the planes came on the ship. What they did was they 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 took the wings off them, and then they loaded them by crane uh, onto the back of the ship. Okay, so th th I was trying and to figure out that the picture of that ship that you had on there, how they got all that on there, because it really doesn't look that large of a vessel to me to have you know those big planes that look huge in those pictures. Oh, I know. But I guess yeah, the they... photographs. Uh, if, if you go back through and, and look at the photographs, um, you'll see the crane uh, on the back portion uh, aft, and uh, and I think I included photos. Um, um, I didn't include photos of them actually unloading the planes because I had so many photographs. You know, <laughs> no, that's I was funny. like, man, this is getting, you know. This is total overload with the photographs. But, I'm sorry, I, I'm, um, I'm throwing you on base here with these questions. <laughs> well, no, you're not. I mean, it's 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 cool because I realized, man, I'm I'm just using uh, all of uh, this woman's stuff, you know, and I didn't want to do that. I was yeah. taking screenshots of all this, basically. Yeah. I thought, man, this would be so cool for people to see this, you know. But it is. <clears throat> I didn't know if I was going to end up with a copyright issue or what. <laughs> so. I tried to limit that as much as possible, but yeah, they they loaded all three of those planes on there. The ship is a lot bigger than than it looks in the photographs, yeah. you know. And uh, but uh, you know, so so their accomplishments with just those three planes. I mean, I th I think they accomplished just as much as a uh, high jump did and Bird did with his photo mapping because they flew uh, 346 total flight hours, which is over a hundred more than bird in flight hours. Um, they covered 39,000 air miles, and that's probably less than bird. But I mean, and they took 14,000 photographs, which is less than bird. His was 75,000, but they covered 450,000 square miles of Antarctica, and, and that's that's just a huge amount of territory, you know, to map. And they, and of course, they discovered the last uh, on unknown coastline in the world uh, that he named uh, 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 after his wife, uh, Jackie Ronnie. He, he named it uh, after her, but they later called it the Ronnie Ice Shelf. And, and they also determined that the Waddell and Ross Seas were not connected, and so that the Antarctic was one continent. And so that blows Bird's theory that, uh, you know, even if the woman set foot on the Palmer Peninsula, that it wasn't really Antarctica, well, it was. I mean, mm -hmm. he, it may have changed since then, you know what I mean, yeah. with, with pieces of pieces of the continent or, or the ice shells breaking off or whatnot, um, but when she set foot on there, it was Antarctica, trust me. Right. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> and another thing, you were talking about the sled dog thing, um, Finn Ronnie covered 3,600 miles by ski and dog sled. Whoa. And that's more more than any other explorer in history. Oh. Put put that into perspective, Mac. It, 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 it's anywhere from 2,400 to 3,500 miles coast to coast across the United States. Wow. <laughs> so it just, I mean, this is just incredible. This, it's, it's almost unhuman. 
I mean, it's a, to do something like that, kid, isn't man. it? Whoa, jeez. Oh, yeah, God. Tough woman, I'll tell you that. <laughs> tough man. I mean, he's like his father. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, God. Is, um, so I, I found a couple of, couple other things here. I, they, they had a flag that was created for the expedition, and, and they flew it on the, on the return trip from the back of the ship. And huh. <clears throat> I, I thought I might have questions about the flag. And, and the flag is uh, the Explorers Club flag. And I guess that uh, both Jackie and Finn Ronnie were, were members of the Explorers Club. Huh. And uh, I don't think I've ever heard of so that, that before, was, but that's interesting. I hadn't either, and, but I but I saw the flag, and I thought, well, somebody's going to ask about that the the images <laughs> the 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 symbols on that flag, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so that's what that's why I, I did that. And so there's a couple photographs of the flag, and or, and one of them with the flag uh, on their way back. And of course, uh, I wondered about mail. You know, remember all the mail and high jump <laughs> that I went so nuts over. Um, so I was wondering yeah. about mail. And in, in January 1947, the U.S. Post Office uh, decided that they weren't going to issue a stamp uh, <laughs> to commemorate the expedition because it wasn't an official government thing, right? And uh, even though it had the support of uh, government agencies they just they didn't issue on the stamp and so i i listed the references to that and and there's some also on uh stamp collectors websites and uh and i also found that that, that there's something about a secret post office being operated by ronnie down there and of course what do you know i'm going to come across this guy eric j Shoren that I told you guys about in uh, part two, <laughs> and and he was the guy that, that claimed that the, there were forty ships involved and that the <laughs> and that there was UFOs and we had to retreat and all this stuff, right? Right. And he says that the secret U.S. post office operated by Ronnie in Antarctica in 1947-48 causes speculation about the real reason behind the two concurrent U.S. expeditions. Uh, high jump and, and Ronnie expedition. And, uh, according, according to this, uh, conspiracy theorist and neo Nazi, <laughs> uh, you know, he was going all on about uh, all this secrecy and stuff. And he said it make, makes one wonder if there was, in fact, uh, some kind of covert or black ops reason, uh, for one or, one or more of the bird expeditions, including high jump. Uh, as well as the private expedition of Captain Ronnie. And, and he, what he does to base this on is he takes a quote from uh, Finn Ronnie from his book um, called uh, Antarctic Conquest, and uh, where Ronnie says, Although no one knew it, I had been operating a U.S. post office too, but for reasons of state had been compelled to keep it a secret. And... Uh, just so you know, I contacted Karen Ronnie Tupac earlier today, <laughs> Jackie's daughter. Really? And wow. I, yes, I did. <laughs> why not? Why not? Yeah, yeah right. Why, why not? Right? <laughs> yeah. Who else is talking I mean, about? Probably nobody. I mean, this is a, this is a hidden history, well, really. You know. Her her contact information is is there on her web page. She has her <laughs> cell phone number. I mean, why not? Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. why not? I was, of course, I was nervous about it. Yeah. But why not? Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Just do it, right? Yeah. Why not? And, and she told me that her father, Finn Ronnie, was authorized by the U.S. State Department to be the postmaster. Uh, but there was a, a, a geopolitical issue with, with the land claims in Antarctica at the time. And so it was decided that, uh, public dis- disclosure of, of an operational U.S. post office down there, might uh, somehow be considered a, a, a land claim by the United States. <laughs> really? Yeah. And it's hard for me to believe that that there is that kind of a, a seriousness. Of course, you know we don't we don't take post postal as, as serious as people did back then. But you know that's kind <laughs> yeah. of weird that that's that means like a you know, I don't know. To me, that just seems like a such a small thing that they were taken so seriously. You know, that's just weird. Well, it does. And, 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 and so it, and it really surprised me that this is why, uh, this was, this was, you know, about this post office of being kept a secret. Because, you know, 
and, and it wasn't because it had anything to do with high jump or secret Nazi stuff. Right. And what, you know what and, I mean? and in, in, in reality, what was the post office, a box on his desk and a stamp in the drawer? I mean, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, and, and Mrs. Tupac said that the, the mail situation, uh, eventually became a real, uh, divisive issue with the crew of the expedition, you know, and, uh, and she may or may not be listening right now, but I'm pretty certain she'll correct me if I made any mistakes about it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but yeah. So, I mean, but this guy, uh, Shoran, this Nazi, neo-Nazi guy, conspiracy theorist, so he, he tries to link, uh, this Ronnie expedition to high jump, uh, you know, and pointing out that, that, uh, Commander Ron, Ronnie didn't allow any mail to be sent home during the expedition, right? Of course, we already know the reason. That, so he, he speculates on why. And, and, he, and he also claims that some male did escape. He uses the word escape <laughs> as, if, as if they were held prisoner down there or something. <laughs> you know, and, and, that, and that mail from the members of the Ronnie expedition uh, is known to have been posted from nearby British bases. I'd love to see his sources of evidence for that. You know, I would. <laughs> Well, he's got it all wrong because he he mentioned black ops. We know the only thing you could have in Antarctica is white ops. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There you go. I'll remember that. Let me write that down right now. It's you know so and of course it, he thought it was curious. You know, it's curious to a lot of uh, polar stamp collectors and followers of Antarctic history that uh, uh, you know that, that there was no post office. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And so, and so he, you know, he's like, he's speculating that, that there's perhaps a larger reason, reason why the post office was kept a secret and, and that the full story about the existence of the post office, uh, as well as even greater secrets may have passed with Captain Ronnie. Hmm. And, but, you know, I, I gotta agree with that considering the harsh environment and the long period of isolation, uh, you know, that the lack of mail would would have been a serious blow to morale, and uh, it's, but you know, and it's also quite a contrast to high jump, you know. Yeah. And um, I mean, maybe it was because the post office in high jump was actually the USS Mount Olympus, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. And but I mean, they did postmark some stuff, uh, some of those covers <laughs> at Little America Four, um, or that maybe it was because uh, the Ronnie expedition was private. You know, and I still have to look into all this to, to sort of pick it apart and, and better explain it. But obviously, Mr. Sh- uh, Shoren didn't know the reason, but I do. You know, I, right. and unfortunately, this seems to be the basis for his linking uh, the Ronnie operation to high jump. And, and But, you know, the guy never mentioned mail and public interest in high jump. And in fact, he was one of the first ones to falsely claim it was top secret. <laughs> so, you know, and, and of course now, now these, uh, these Ronnie expedition covers are like rare collectibles. <laughs> and, and so I, I saw one that even sold at auctions for like 450 pounds. Or oh, wow. Like that. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, well, I mean, and, you know, those things have, those, those things got some, uh, they've got some real uh, mileage on them. <laughs> you know, they've been around. <laughs> well, they they are rare and and from what what she told me today from what Mrs. Tupac told me today uh, the, they are rare and, and you know they have sold a, a few and I think she still has some but yeah I mean so um, in January 1948 they they started uh, preparing to uh, bring everything to an end down there and. Um, uh, the team was rescued, or I want to say rescued, they just, they helped break up the ice so they could get out, and, uh, um, by a uh, wind class icebreaker arriving for Operation Windmill, and I told you that Windmill was the follow-up operation, the high jump, right? Mm, right. And, uh, the, uh, USS Adisto entered the area on December 27th, 47, so that they could set, set the, uh, ground control points for the flights, uh, the high jump. And, uh, and of course they, they also provided support to the Ronnie expedition, uh, so they could, uh, smash away to, uh, so that they, they could sail out of there. And, um, and so this, um, this was the end. I mean, this was, uh, 
the end of uh, private explorations, and after that, it was all government programs. Uh, I, I definitely, that, I definitely want to be on this USS Adisto. That's the pl- if I'm going on a ship, Adisto. I'm sorry, my pronunciation is not good. But if if yeah. if the, I'm going to go to the Antarctic, that looks like the ship I want to be on. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so they uh, they 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 got out of there uh, safely, and, and they made the trip home. They came back to uh, New York Harbor, uh, April fifteenth, nineteen forty eight, and they had this grand reception with the even the harbor master uh, and the tugs fired off their. Uh, uh, their salutes with the high pressure, uh, uh, hoses and stuff. And, and, uh, there was a lot of people waiting for them on the docks, um, to greet them when they came back. And after that, they, they had a, a, quite a period of, uh, fame and publicity, you know, even, even, uh, even the, uh, like the, uh, Life magazine, uh, version of, in, in Norway. Um, they had him on it in uh, 62 and 64 on the covers uh, of the Norway's uh, version of Life magazine. And uh, I guess Jackie had quite a few honors given to her. And the one that's most interesting to me is that she was awarded the U.S. Antarctic Service Medal, a mm-hmm. military award, and she's been the only woman to ever receive it. I think that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool, you know, and these photos of yeah. around the globe, those that one giant globe, the National Archives globe, that's pretty cool. I yeah. don't see where that's at. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by yeah, globes. They, they named that after, after uh, um, uh, Jack and Ronnie, uh, yeah, they named it after the two of them. Yeah. So it was, like, dedicated to them at the National Archives there. That's, pre- that's pretty cool. I, I'd seen pictures of that before and had no idea that it had anything to do with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> So that was awesome. I mean, and, uh, and of course, what they did was they started doing lecture tours after they had so much publicity and, and, uh, uh, Finn Ronnie, um, wrote four books, uh, from like, uh, 1949 to 1979. The one in 79 was his own, uh, autobiography. And of course, Jackie edited all those for him. And one interesting thing that she also did was was she wrote the annual updates for Encyclopedia Britannica. Britannica. Wow. Really? When when it yeah, when it when it came to the Antarctic, she wrote all those annual updates for Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh. And and the thing is I I may have read those and never even knew that she wrote them. <laughs> That's <laughs> insane. I mean, wow, what a life, man. It's just incredible, isn't it? It is. And, and, of course, uh, she published her own autobiography in 2004, and that was called uh, Antarctica's First Lady. And um, I just think it's, a, it's just an awesome story. I mean, they did have problems <clears throat> during the expedition, and she addresses those in her book. And, and these were due mainly to the extended period of isolations and the tensions that, that happens, you know, when people are just so close together uh, and... Um, they had several accidents, but luckily they didn't have any casualties, and they completed the mission. And uh, Jackie Ronnie never regretted being part of it, she said. And so, you know, if these conspiracy theorists and the pseudo-historians want to claim that uh, Bird was silenced after high jump, maybe it was because he was too proud to admit that the Ronnie expedition was a success <laughs> and, his, and his efforts to sabotage it failed, you know. And, uh, but there's almost no mention of the Ronnie expedition or Operation Windmill or that Edith, uh, Jackie Ronnie was, was the first American woman to set foot in Antarctica uh, and that she and Jenny Darlington were the first women to ever be in an Arctic, uh, Antarctic expedition over the winter. And uh, it's just a shame that the story is buried under all the fictional revisions of history. Um, I'm mm-hmm. hoping this will change over time. You know. Yeah, I mean it's it's a story gunner that I've never heard of, and uh, you you got to think of the you know the logistics of getting down there. I mean the time they spent, you know, I mean it it, it was a brutal it's a brutal place today. Uh, it would have been you know doubly hard at, back in those days, and it, the the piece of this, you know, of course the fantastic nature of the the women going down there, and the one you mentioned earlier, I can't don't remember the name, but it sailed around there back way before that, which would have been. Like even harder than that, 
in my eyes, but you, you start talking about Bird and the and the and the 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 actual way that he tried to interrupt their their expedition. I mean, it starts to it starts to me to kind of build into some not the conspiracy theory nature. I know you've disapproved a lot of that, but maybe maybe Bird had his own agenda. Maybe it was personal agenda. Maybe he was doing an agenda trying to you know block these folks from reporting their science just to, so he could later on do some of these weird spins that people have used, you know, and, and try to build some kind of weird thing going on. It just sounds odd to me that he was such a, um, such a bad guy in this, in this presentation you've given tonight. I mean, it just, that just kind of plays into some weird questions in my mind, but. It does, but, but I think, but I think that, uh, uh, rather than it going from, you know, into some kind of, uh, another conspiracy <laughs> uh, I, I i would just say that that uh, that ha- had a lot to do with with bird's uh, personality and like i said after researching all this this has really changed my view of admiral bird uh, you know because it's not the story that i was told uh, as a kid in yeah. virginia growing up you know i said this is not the man <laughs> that i was told admiral bird was yeah. And uh, but I would rather know the truth. I would rather know the truth about it. And uh, like I said, it's just an am- amazing thing uh, to find th- this story of the Ronnie expedition um, as, as I was researching Operation High Jump. And uh, you know, I really recommend that people watch this 30-minute video on YouTube with with her daughter uh, Karen Ronnie Tupac. Um, this that's called Edith Jackie Ronnie, a pioneer in Antarctic exploration. It's on YouTube. You know, people should really watch it. You know, I think it's really great. I mean, if you, and if you listen to, uh, 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 Karen, uh, Tupac's voice, it sounds, it sounds a lot like her mother. Oh, really? <laughs> it really does. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. And, that's and really I did, cool. And, and I did request permission from, uh, Karen Ronnie Tupac, uh, to use the clip that we aired tonight. And, uh, for the use of, uh, those photos and everything. And, and of course, uh, and she granted it. She granted it. And she seemed very appreciative of my efforts to put the story out there. Yeah. So, I mean, it, I, I'm pretty, appreciative. I think, you know, and, you know, not to be, I kind of thought it was ironic. I thought about that earlier today that this story I knew was coming up and it was, and someone mentioned the National Women's Month thing, but it really is. Yeah. It is appropriate. I mean, I, it, I, I said it that is. in a joking manner, but it is very appropriate because this is a story. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it, it really is a unique story. I mean, this is something that um, somebody should probably make a movie about. I mean, the two, I could see the conflict between yeah, the two women, I, you know, and the, you know, yeah. getting pregnant down there. There's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of <laughs> yeah. storylines here, man. It's really an interesting it, story. It really is. And, th- and think about it. I mean, it, this, this, the whole range of this from the age of sail, mm-hmm. I mean, starting it with, with the expeditions prior to this with, with her grandfather. Uh, you know, and uh, Karen's or uh, Karen's grandfather, and, and then and then her mother and father, and this whole thing about the, 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 and of course leave high jump out of the whole damn thing. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, just just portray what it what it was in the history of these people and the Ronnie expedition itself. I think that would be a great thing. It, it, yeah, you know? it certainly is, and I always find it interesting. You know, when you start talking about these private expeditions, who was funding those things? You know me, I'm always going back right. looking at that. And, and it's, it's, it was a strange time in American history. You know, there was a lot of money barons around, you know, and the interest in yeah. people were going down there, you know, it's just a, it's, it's, it was it you know, just for the adventure. I mean, it, I know that these guys, Ronnie and bird, of course they were adventurous fellows and they, you know, they were, you know, they were alpha males. They, they wanted to get in front of each other. Nobody wanted to get beat down there and find something to get the big name. But, you know, in the end, you know, it, it still goes back. They had to have the money and that seemed to be a bit right. of consternation amongst those two. And I'm certain there's probably other individuals we, have, we haven't even got to that got pushed to the side by both of them. You know, there's probably, a, you know, 50 more guys who thought they could go down there at some point and wanted to. Yeah. But, you know, I, I've included uh, all those answers for people. Yep. I mean, all the questions that you just asked me about the funding and all this other stuff. Yep. Um, is, is on is on the uh, Ronnie Arctic Explorers uh, website, and it, it even lists who gave the doll, who gave the money. I mean, it, I mean, and, and from where? From from okay. the school children, you name it. I mean, it's all there. Awesome. It's all documented. 
Great stuff, yeah. Gunner. It's this has been a fantastic little journey that we've been on for the last five weeks. I, this one was one I wasn't expecting, but it may be a it may have been my favorite yet. <laughs> I think so too. I, I I think I enjoyed this the best out of all of them. I really did. Awesome, man. Well, appreciate all your hard work. I certainly do, man. And um, thank you, and have a great night. Good night, Mac. Thanks. Hey, there goes Gunner, man. That was, what do you think about that beast? I know that you're a woman. That Last was I... my favorite. Whoa. Sorry, hot mic. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I was on the chat going nuts. I was like, oh my God, this would be a, this would be the best movie ever. Like I would go to the movies and see this movie. Yeah, it's interesting for sure. I would love this. Uh, I mean, and it, you I know. cannot thank Gunner enough for doing this. He was probably my favorite. Yeah, you no, know? it was, it's seriously an interesting story. Um, all the way around, you know, the the woman piece of it for sure is interesting. And, you know, the, you start talking about the ladies, the pe- per- people who sailed around, you know, the whaler and she come back and flew over. Yeah. I mean, that's just stories, you know, you're not, not, not making, not making movies about that. That's for sure. And maybe they should, but you know, you know, look- you think about this is a, a really unknown piece of history and I, I really, really like this. Uh, it certainly is very unknown. I'm going to take a quick break right here. I'll be back in mere moments. This is the Patriot Outlaws broadcasting worldwide. <laughs>